what we're about to do yield favorable results, may give us the capacity to benefit others, may help us overcome ignorance and limitation, may clear away all obstacles on the path, may lead us to the union of wisdom and compassion. Om Ah Om Soha. The first thing that I'm going to ask you is to uh, pretend that the first first line of the prayer doesn't say to renew and purify my practice, but to renew and purify my dharma cultivation. Okay? We're all in it? Mm-hmm. We're all going to pretend? All right. <laughs> so let us read together. Everything else is... I bow to the Lord of compassion to renew and purify my dharma cultivation for practices are best. I shall adopt those acts that lead to happiness, the immeasurable four, the noble eight, the perfect ten. I shall avoid those acts that lead to suffering, the five of immediate retribution, the four root immoralities, the loss of mindfulness, the branches of indiscipline, and breaking my commitments. Bless me to guard my conduct with firm zeal. I shall make gross, subtle, and very subtle offerings to the three jewels and to all my superiors, surrendering my aggregates and all that I possess. Bless me to serve the precious ones with time, talent, and treasure. I shall make constant offering of mindfulness to their protectors, that they may watch over my practice, uphold the view, keep me from harm, dispel all obstacles, and pacify my enemies. Bless me to stay under their watchful eye. If I encounter happiness, let me be grateful. If I encounter suffering, let me redouble effort. Bless me to know that gratitude is wisdom and effort is compassion. So this is one of those prayers that has a lot of references that we need to (laughs) explain. But once we know these things, it's very easy to remember. So as usual, we begin our mind training prayer with a reverence to the Lord of Compassion. Again, who is the Lord of Compassion? But who is that somebody outside? It's what? It's an aspect of our inner natural perfection of our own Buddha nature. That is not, we shouldn't go to the other extreme to then say, well then, you know, Chen Rezik doesn't exist. Like many people will jump to that conclusion. Actually, Chen Rezik exists much more really than any of us, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Because after all, we are as we think of ourselves, we're egos, we're impermanent, we're dependent, and we are insubstantial. <laughs> Chen Rezik is actually much more existent than we are, um, much more real, but not in that separate way in which ordinary human beings like to conceive of people. So we begin to renew and purify my dharma cultivation for practices are best. And the great teacher Padmasambhava explained that because every moment is new, we are always in need of renewal of our practice, of our cultivation. And because at this moment we are covered with the veils of ignorance and afflicted emotions, we always are in need of purification. So that's why to renew and purify my dharma cultivation, those are the two things that are necessary for practices are best. 
right? If you go to the bottom of the page, not yet to the notes, not to the reference notes, but to where we have the mind training instructions, uh, this uh, prayer is the mind training prayer for verses 17 and 18. And what are those? Verse 17 is four practices are the best methods. Adopting positive acts, abandoning negative acts, making offerings to the superiors, and making offerings to the protectors. And then instruction 18 is work with whatever you encounter. I would like to uh, make a note here that uh, instruction 17 is missing in most other versions of mind training. I rarely find it anywhere else. How come? Well, some of them have 57. <coughs> we have 63. Obviously, there's got to be some that are <laughs> that are here that are right there. Right. Um, this kind of a crucial one. This is a very crucial one. We're kind of uh, always uh, surprised that it's managed to slip out of others. So these four things are absolutely essential, right? You have to adopt that which is positive. You have to abandon that which is negative. But here, there are two things, right? Making offerings to the superiors and making offerings to the protectors, which we usually don't encounter. So we will see what they mean. The first, I shall adopt those acts that lead to happiness. The measurable four, these are mental acts. Right? What are these mental acts? Compassion, the desire to reduce the suffering of others. Love, the desire to increase the happiness of others. Rejoicing in the happiness and merit and virtue of all other beings. And equanimity, which means treating all beings the same. The same meaning with love, with compassion, and with rejoicing, mm. right? Not equally badly. <laughs> I had a, a boss once <laughs> at a university who actually, it was true, she said, I treat everybody the same. It was true. She treated everybody very poorly. <laughs> she did not discriminate. <laughs> Her nickname was Safia Gaddafi. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> Gaddafi, he was a dictator of Libya. His wife was uh, very uh, harsh. <laughs> when this particular boss of mine learned that uh, they were calling her that, she called the guy who started the nickname and said, You, you are calling me Safia Gaddafi. And he was scared. <laughs> she, she was known to hit people. And, uh, and he finally said, Yes, I did. And she said, I like that. <laughs> Keep saying it. <laughs> no, not that kind of equanimity, right? The, the other kind. The kind that is based on love, compassion, and rejoicing. So those are the immeasurable force. They're at, they're, they are acts of thought. The noble eight refers to the Eightfold noble path, right? We have right view, right thought, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Of course, we could speak a whole night about any of those. But basically, what we have is the Buddha's instructions, the Buddha's direct instructions on how to have a rounded cultivation, right? One that is not missing anything. So, yes, we need right view and right thought. Right view is basically to discard duality and separation. Right thought actually means to have good intentions towards everyone, right? Right speech means not only to avoid um, lies, but to avoid slander. And a Buddhist definition of slander is um, much more stringent 
than the one we have. Here in this country, slander has to be false, right? It's something false we say about someone. And the definition of slander in Buddhism is anything said to discredit another, even if it's true. If the intention is to discredit another person, it is slander. And most of the time when we speak ill of other people, it's not really to defend anyone, or to, it's basically to discredit them, right? whether it's true or not. Uh, in Buddhism, it says it's not necessary, don't do it. Um, it also includes harsh speech, right? that we should try to speak gently. Gossip too, yes? Oh, yes. Well, I thought, <laughs> yes. Gossip is not a... It's usually done either to discredit someone or to exaggerate the non-existent virtues of another. <laughs> Effort refers to constantly being mindful of what your goal is and doing something I mean, it doesn't have to be an all-out, you know, run, um, a sprint. But to a right effort means to be constantly making whatever advancement is possible. A right effort refers to not taking days off your cultivation. I'll be kind tomorrow. You know, which, you know, it may sound funny, but a lot of people take time off from the Dharma. You know, I'll follow tomorrow, but today I'm going to do this and this and that. And they do, they, they schedule their <laughs> non-Dharma times, right? So right effort means constantly. Concentration refers to training the mind to rest where you put it. That's what concentration means. This is um, not something that we do uh, on a regular basis, right? The mind actually puts us where it wants. Concentration means that you develop the capacity to rest the mind where you decide it should rest. That it should be one-pointed. And not one-pointed, because sometimes the mind can be one-pointed in what you don't want to <laughs> rest on. It should be one-pointed and of your choice. Discernment literally means the capacity to determine what is to be adopted and what is to be avoided. That's what it means. Skillful means refers, and this is, oops, I'm, I'm, I jumped, right, uh, excuse me, the after speech conduct, which is our, our way of dealing with others, it's, it's another way of speaking of morality. Livelihood refers to how we earn a living and also how we live our lives, what we would call today lifestyle. Uh, under this, for example, would fall, you know, like how large is your is carbon footprint and uh, do you recycle and uh, do you take care of other sentient beings? Uh, it's not only what type of job you do, although evidently uh, that needs to be in, uh, in consideration. Uh, the Buddha expressly forbid certain types of work, like uh, to his disciples, obviously not to society at large, but those who uh, willingly accepted his teaching, he said, you know, do not deal in arms, weapons, do not deal in intoxicants, uh, do not deal in animals or people <laughs> selling, uh, do not uh, they don't become a butcher right? or a prostitute. Right? Uh, all of that, you know, you have to evaluate. Right? 
but those are the, the ones that the Buddha said, you know, they're incompatible with the Dharma. Yes. And when you said you do not deal with armor, does that include like if somebody does ice cream? You know what is ice cream? Um, ice cream. No, 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 no. Yes, no, no, no. Deal meaning it, it do not become a weapons uh, seller. Okay. Yes, to sell weapons, okay. uh, to traffic in weapons, okay. because you're contributing to. No, it's not practicing as clean as it's for. Well, we pay taxes we're all weapons dealers. Well, no. <laughs> yes, um, I agree. Yes, but uh, no, that's not our intention. Remember, right. karma is voluntary, willful act, right? Um, you're not responsible for what people do, right? Uh, what other people do. You're only responsible for what you do. We are, and you try, right? You try within your means. But remember, there is no political, social, or economic solution to the burning house. So let's not get too into this thing, because it never ends. Yes. And the solution, I guarantee, will have problems too. If you were able, if you were given absolute power, to change everything, I guarantee that flaws would immediately begin to arise. This is the history of every revolution, right? And every invention. Uh, yes. Nothing been invented to help that also doesn't harm. That is the nature of the phenomenal world. So yes, I mean, we should be, you know, we should use our discernment. But we need not obsess about this thing because they have no material solution. Our problem is spiritual, right? It's not material. That doesn't mean that we don't stop whatever suffering is in our power to stop. Uh, Buddhists are not told to, you know, sit back and allow the world to go to pieces. <clears throat> But also do not obsess about it. Because if you obsess about it, you will lose your peace. And then you're part of the problem. So right view, right thought, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness refers to always remembering what is your goal? A lot of people now think that mindfulness is like paying attention to everything you do, and and that is part of it. But it's you could be extremely mindful in that sense and be incredibly negative, right? <laughs> you could be paying attention to everything that you do wrong. That's not the meaning of mindfulness. The, the term in Sanskrit is smriti. Smriti means to remember. To remember what? Remember your goal. Remember the instructions of your teachers. That's what it means. It's not, you know, people use that phrase way too freely now. You know, I'm just being mindful. You know, drive mindfully. Well, if you drive mindfully, it means that you drive in accordance with the Dharma. That's what it means. That to be mindful means that you live as much as possible in accordance with the Dharma. And concentration, as we said, is to be able to rest the mind in one place of your choice. So the Noble Eight, the perfect ten, these are the famous paramitas, the perfections. Right? A lot of people speak of six, but there are actually ten. The only reason that we speak most often of six is because four of them are very high level. Right? But just because something is very high level 
we shouldn't pretend it doesn't exist. It's like, you know, you don't tell your children when they're young, oh, you only need to go to six years of school <laughs> because they're not ready to deal with high school, right? Or middle school or whatever. No, you tell them how far they have to go. You don't lie to them and say, oh, it's only these six. <laughs> right? um, so the ten perfections are generosity, morality, Patience, effort, concentration, discernment, skillful means, aspiration, power, and wisdom. Now, why are they called perfections? Because we all do some of this. They're called perfections because they are to be practiced without attachment to agent, action, or object of the action. That's what makes them perfect. Let's take generosity, right? If I give somebody a hundred dollars, it's an act of gener and they need it. It's an act of generosity, right? But it's not perfect generosity if I give it with the expectation that this person would say thank you and praise me and you know applaud and all that stuff it's not perfect if i only give it to people i like right so here's the the object right and it's not perfect if i am calculating well i'll give a hundred because it really doesn't affect my finances <laughs> right you see what it means? Like the three spheres have to be free, right? It's not every one of the perfections need to be practiced without attachment to the agent, the action, or the object of the action. That's what it means to be a perfection. That's in terms of, so we only need to really adopt these three sets. Isn't that easy? Four immeasurables, the noble eight, and the perfect ten. Right? If we are mindful of them, actually we will spontaneously begin to act that way. It all begins in the mind. Every action that you have ever performed began in your mind, whether consciously or unconsciously. Unfortunately, most of, the, of those actions begin unconsciously, but they begin in the mind. So the first step is to cultivate the awareness that this is what we want to do. And little by little it will come. There's many practices that will help us do that. So that's in terms of adopting the positive. Then the text continues, so I shall avoid those acts that lead to suffering. And here's another interesting list. The five of immediate retribution are negative acts so powerful that they change your consciousness in ways that are instantaneous. Now, it doesn't mean that the full effect of that negative karma happens immediately, but a very strong effect happens simultaneous with the action. Right? And these are killing your mother, killing your father, killing a saint, wounding a Buddha, or splitting the Sangha. Creating dissension in the Sangha. Right? They immediately affect the mind very, very powerfully. And they cause immediate suffering. I'm not talking about, you know, in the cases of the killing, whether the, it's not that the law will catch you immediately. No, that's, it's the mental effect is immediate. So those five 
most of us really don't have to worry about them too much, right? We do have to worry about splitting the Sangha. That is, uh, unfortunately, very common these days. The four root immoralities were actually very uh, <clears throat> familiar with these. These are the first four of the five precepts. Right? So what are the root immoralities? The four root immoralities are killing, lying, stealing, and sexual misconduct. And you may ask, where is the fifth precept? <laughs> It's coming right now. The loss of mindfulness. Right? That is intoxication. Intoxication. The problem with intoxication. Intoxication is not considered immoral in and of itself. It is a negative act because it leads to heedlessness. People who are intoxicated tend to kill, lie, steal, and engage in sexual misconduct. The next three are not so familiar to us in the West, and we may have issues with them. The branches of indiscipline. These are negative acts that contribute to the four roots of immorality. What are they? They are frivolity and seductive self-adornment. You know, and actually frivolity, I'm being kind here because most people would object, but frivolity means singing, dancing, playing music, listening to music, and Think about it. Think about what people listen to. I mean, uh, people are not really listening to, you know, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony most of the time, right? Uh, they're listening to some very attachment-oriented lyrics, right? Uh, which do not contribute to uh, purifying the mind. And on the contrary, and the rhythms are very uh, sensual, and, uh, and the lyrics these days, I mean, some of them are just atrocious, right? Atrocious. So, uh, basically, that's considered frivolous entertainment. If the Buddha had lived today, I think he would throw in TV. <laughs> I really think so. Um, of course, that's kind of a real downer for selling Buddhism because people are going to say, oh, those Buddhists, they don't have any fun. <laughs> well, we, we, sour we, faces. <laughs> actually, you know, don't you know that I always tell you to smile during meditation? That's very important. <laughs> but, you know, we say frivolous entertainment and allow people to figure it out by themselves. The other part of that one, right, is seductive self-adornment, and that includes the use of cosmetics, the use of perfumes, and the use of ornamentation, right? Uh, but the, the important thing is that it's, it's used to be seductive. Right? It's basically using adornment to you know, attract other beings sexually. And uh, another one is inappropriate foods and times. This one is also uh, kind of difficult for people in the West, but it means to choose your foods according to your dharma. Right? And according to the dharma, it means that you choose foods that do not require killing or harming other sentient beings, right? And at inappropriate times, uh, it is actually left 
uh, open because for monastics it means one thing, for uh, for lay people it it varies. It depends on your occupation. It depends on your culture, etc. But what it means is that your eating should not inconvenience other people. That's what it means, in appropriate times. Your eating should not inconvenience others. Your eating habits, particularly, should not prevent others from cultivating the Dharma. Does a coffee and chocolate change? <laughs> no. What about onion? I heard some people don't eat onion. You're laughing. But... In monasteries, for a very good reason, let me tell you. When you when you have 400 people breathing together, uh, it's not good when they eat an onions and garlic. Believe me. In monasteries, it is avoided completely. What, what kind of time uh, disturb the What do you mean this, beside the monastic uh, life? Well, people? let's say, for example, that you live with other people and you know that they meditate at a certain time. It's not the time for you to be clanging, you know, pots and pans or, you know, frying things that you know, would interrupt their meditation. It's just to be aware that eating is a social thing even if you eat alone. So not being inconsiderate. Exactly. Most of this is to, to be considerate and not to be uh, pushing things on others, you know. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, when I was married, um, I was a vegetarian and my ex-mother-in-law was always trying to get me to eat things with meat and lying about it. Oh, it's vegetarian. And then you'd see like the swimming chunks of pork in the thing. It's like, that also means, you know, do not tempt people with things that are not for them. And, and not only for moral reasons. I mean, you're not going to go and offer candy to a diabetic. That's also inappropriate timing. Right? Mm -hmm. Not in this lifetime. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so there's... Food, the reason it's singled out is, is there anything more typically human? I mean, even when we think of socializing, most of it is our own food. Right? So we need to become, we need to develop a great awareness that food can be either a support for Dharma cultivation or a serious impediment. That's why it's here. It's not, some people say like, oh no, what the Buddha meant is that you cannot eat after noon. And some people say, no, you cannot eat after the sun has set. Those were, those instructions are specific to a time, a place, and a circumstance. The real meaning is Use your food to support your dharma cultivation and do not allow your food to interrupt your dharma cultivation or that of others. That's what it means. In a monastery, for example, you do not, you know, go around, you know, with a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> while the monks are studying or practicing their debating or... Right? It's a peculiar environment. People are busy doing certain things. But it would be the same thing, you know. We may all have experienced working in an office where there's someone constantly eating something. Isn't it very disturbing? <laughs> it used to be the donuts on Friday. Oh, there's like alcohol, you know. What, you're taking me to a bar. Yes. The donuts in front of me, and I had to, I had to leave every Friday. <laughs> that's inconsiderate of them. Yes. yes, inconsiderate of them. So that's what it means. We have to always analyze this. Remember, is to renew and purify our Dharma cultivation. These are all 
four practices to do that, right? They're not there, you know, just to make things difficult. They're actually there to make Dharma cultivation easier. So, those are the branches of the discipline. And the last one, which is very important, is you have to avoid breaking your commitments. And actually, no one knows your commitments better than you do. By the way, there are people who go, particularly, this happens a lot uh, when they visit ethnic Buddhist temples for ceremonies, and they don't know what's going on, but they participate, and then afterwards somebody tells them, do you know that you promised to do this and this and that? And people are afraid. No, if you don't know that you promised it, you did not promise it. A promise is, by its nature, voluntary, isn't it? Nobody can tell you, oh, you promised, you just didn't know you did. <laughs> well, you signed here. No, we don't do those tricks. Right? So you know your commitments, but when you make a commitment, right, breaking a commitment is actually very negative, not because somebody's going to punish you, but because you will lose faith in yourself. There's nothing, nothing more self-defeating than looking at yourself and saying, oh, I tried that and I, I didn't do it. I promised to do that and I didn't do it. I'm a failure. I'll never do what's right. So keeping commitments is important. Now in Buddhism, we recognize that ordinary beings are weak. And there is a way we can restore our commitments if they're broken. Some commitments actually you can give back. And it's better to give it back than to break it. And it's perfectly okay. Even monastic orders can be given back with no penalty. We're not thrown into hell or anything like that. So, but one should respect one's own commitments because of the danger of then fomenting this uh, lack of confidence in yourself. Just like, you know, if you give your word to someone that you'll show up and you don't show up, they're not going to believe you. If you give your word that you're going to engage in a particular practice or a particular discipline and you break it, you won't trust yourself. So that's all it means. Bless me to guard my conduct with firm zeal. That means that we should be extremely careful about our actions. And here I have to say that, what is the phrase in English? Familiarity breeds contempt. Sometimes we're much kinder with strangers and much more careful with strangers than we are with those that are close to us. In fact, I often advise people, as strange as it may sound, treat your nearest and dearest as strangers. You'll probably treat them better. <laughs> Doesn't it happen all the time? We take shortcuts. Like with strangers we always say please and thank you. With those at home, now give me that. <laughs> Go away. Uh, no. We should be careful and and you know most of our time, I bet, we don't spend it with strangers, do we? So then it becomes the bulk of your conduct is not your best standard. So we have to be very careful, you know, and take 
be mindful that just because people know we're good <laughs> doesn't mean that we can act as if we weren't. Oh, she knows what I mean. Well, yeah, but it's nicer to let her experiencing experience your goodness. Let him or her experience your kindness. Not just know, oh, she knows I don't mean any anything by it. Well, if you don't mean anything by it, don't do it. Or don't say it. The next stanza, right? We begin now with the offerings. I shall make gross, subtle, and very subtle offerings to the three jewels and to all my superiors. Gross offerings are physical or tangible offerings. Subtle offerings are mental offerings. And very subtle offerings are aspirations. Now, human beings, ordinary human beings, are extremely attached. In fact, this realm, the human realm, is characterized by desire and struggle. We are very, very attached to our possessions, beginning with the body. We really love our stuff. So it's not that the three jewels, the three jewels are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, need our stuff. It is actually for our Benefit. That's why mental offerings are just as good and sometimes even better than physical offerings. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to do away with our selfishness. So when we offer, when we make offerings, right, of physical things, of mental things, and subtle things, aspirations, are like very strong promises, intentions that align with the will of the Buddhas. Right? When we make those offerings to the Three Jewels and to our superiors, our superiors are all our teachers, the, the noble Sangha, etc. Right? It, it includes our parents too, believe it or not. When we do that, we're actually cultivating generosity. We are also cultivating detachment. For example, and in our lineage, it's very simple, perhaps because you know we were living on the on the roads for so many centuries that we don't make grandiose offerings. We actually tend to offer water. Right? You probably have seen in many altars, there's seven little cups, right? And we make offerings, and actually we use the water to symbolize all that we're offering. And what we offer is we offer the, the elements, we offer uh, the senses, we offer the consciousness, we offer even our afflicted mind. We offer our uh, our alaya vigyana, our, our uh, ground consciousness. Right? Because that's really all we have. That is really all we have. But we can get into the habit when we see something beautiful, offer it in your mind to the three jewels. If you see a beautiful flower, don't ha don't cultivate the tendency of oh let me you know, let me smell that you know it's all for me 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 oh I, that's beautiful uh, we have that tendency we do let's confess it's true <laughs> right so it's developing this idea of making offerings constantly if there's something beautiful offer it anything you like a lot of people say like you know what if it's not offerable if you like it it's offerable because it's to purify you. The Buddhas don't need it. Right? It's to purify you. 
like for example, th those who have seen me, you know, if, if I eat at a restaurant or something, right? I mean, I will order vegetarian food, but some of it technically is not offerable. Like if it has onions, for example, or and most things do. And some people ask me like, well, that's not offerable. Why are you praying? So because. What am I going to do? Every time, oh, that's not offerable, so I'm, I'm going to get out of the habit mm -hmm. of giving thanks for my food and offering the food for the, for the well-being of other sentient beings. No. This is what I am eating. If it's good enough for me, <laughs> if I like it, it's offerable. And maybe if it really isn't, maybe it will start to develop a little bit of uh, awareness that perhaps you shouldn't do that either. Right? So I'm telling you, I'm not in encouraging you to do it, but if you are going to eat a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, offer it. It's not offerable, but offer it. Maybe the dissonance will sooner or later click in your mind. Yes. Like if if somebody um, notices a shortcoming in themselves, is that okay to offer to the Buddha, to the Buddha, the the awareness of this shortcoming and and the shortcoming itself? Yes, and yeah. and the shortcoming itself. We have to because very often we are we have them because we're attached to them. All the errors that we have, all the afflicted emotions that we have, we have them. Even though we think we don't like it, if we have them, we like them and we're attached to them. It's part of our identity. We've discussed this before. You know, people are really attached to their suffering because that's how they think of themselves. That strengthens the ego. I am the one who went through this. I went. People say it all the time. I went through hell and high water. It's strengthening the ego. Suffering strengthens the ego like nothing else. You know, look at countries. What are the countries with the strongest national feeling? Those that have been oppressed or abused or attacked or nationalism is always stronger in countries that have suffered oppression. And sometimes I invent it. <laughs> I know yeah. we're the victims. But victimhood is a very strong identity. Very strong identity. So what do we offer to the three jewels and to all our superiors? My aggregates, the aggregates are that which we confuse with ourselves, right? our form or our body, our sensations, our feelings, our perceptions, our thoughts, right? our tendencies, our karmic formations, our histories, right? and our consciousness, which none of which is us. Right? But that's what we identify with. So we surrender it. That's what we offer. We offer it all. Actually, we have a, a beautiful prayer. Who wants it? They do. <laughs> we offer it. Who wants our formations? The, the, Buddha, the Buddhas do. I was going to say, we're offering our shortcomings. That's a lot of offerings. So. <laughs> it's a lot of offering. <laughs> and they take it. They take it. We have a, a beautiful prayer that, that we use whenever we do our rituals in which we actually, we, we do it for refuge, we do it for Bodhisattva vows, we actually start, you know, I offer earth, smell, the sense of smell, the consciousness of smell, then we move on to the next one, I offer water, taste, the sense of taste, and the consciousness of taste, and we go one by the other until we have offered everything and and what do we have? We have then the stainless remainder. Through purity, true self, through bliss, true permanence. Right? But you can only have that when you've given everything else away. Very powerful. 
stretch. I feel so good when I said it. Mm -hmm. His heavy blanket off of me. <laughs> yes. And the wonderful thing is that they actually like it. Those of you who are, you know, mothers and fathers, if your children, you know, little children come in all dirty, and they ask you to help you clean them, doesn't that make you happy? Happier than if they want to stay dirty. <laughs> doesn't it? If they come in and they say, oh, <laughs> You know, I need a shower, I need a bath. Oh, that makes a parent happy. Wow! <laughs> Not hiding from the water today. <laughs> right. Your offering and surrender go hand in hand. Yes. And is surrendering possible without offering? It may be, but it would be rare. So it's easier, it's a vehicle for Yes. Surrender. Basically, my friend, all of these things will be ripped out of our dead, cold hands if we don't give them, right? <laughs> it's like everything else, right? Everything will be taken from you sooner or later. So your choice is how to separate from your possessions, including your body, right? That's the only choice we have. We, our choice is not whether we give it up or not. Our choice is how. You can do it willingly and kindly and make a really nice uh, act out of it, or you can you know, try to hold on and you will lose. So that's our only choice. I struggle a lot when we like, are flipping back and forth about talking about whether these beings are just emanations, you know, within ourselves, like you were saying, each other. And yes. Or do you, and now we're, we're flipping back and we're talking about them like they're really external beings that are there to help us. They are both. And I can't, I just, they are more I real know, than what yeah, we think of ourselves. I keep going, you know, every time we talk, I, I, then I go back and I try to resolve that in my mind. It's an obstacle. Though no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> it's not incompatible. The fact that your Buddha nature is more real than what you think of yourself right now. So an aspect of your Buddha nature is more real. And let me ask you a question. That's also true, for example, of your husband. How you see your husband is not particularly real. Right? So... The Buddhas, Chenrezig, all of them, are more real than the people you relate to. But are they just inside me, or are they out there to help me? Both. <laughs> is, is he really there? Uh, no, I'm sorry. No. He's not. Not as you see him. I feel super mean. He's got some stains, but he's in there. He's generous. Yes. On all of Yes, they are there too. In fact, they are there much more clearly and strongly and purely because they don't have afflicted emotions. See, even the kindest people that we know, all of them have wrong views and afflicted emotions. The great thing about the Buddha is they don't. There's no separateness. Huh? There's no separateness. Yes, they don't see you as, you know, that other being. But as long as we are ordinary beings, there is nothing wrong with thinking of them as external. It's not accurate but it's as accurate as the rest of our experience, even more so. The she so the Buddha nature is in everybody. Every sentient being. If they cultivate it. No, it is always there, whether they cultivate it or not. It doesn't manifest. It doesn't show. But it's there, and it's complete. That's why even the worst beings often have moments of like incredible uh, brilliance in, in different fields. People who are atrocious in their behavior 
sometimes we'll have a moment of like incredible generosity or bravery or kindness right? because that Buddha nature is there it's covered right? but it's still there and it's completely there we all have it now when you cultivate it what cultivation is actually removing the covering it's not building anything it's just removing coverings. And little by little it shows more and more. So what do we do? We surrender the aggregates and all that we possess. Like we were saying, you know, everything that we possess is going to be taken away. Uh, we discussed in our uh, yoga of dying. <laughs> <laughs> One of my most popular workshops. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's true. It's full every time. It's full every time. <laughs> it's full every time. But <laughs> people that approach it with hesitation, and they think we're going to practice. Ready. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that is recommended, you know, as a preparation for death. You know, when there are clear signs of death, one of the most important things that we can do is to give everything away. Everything. For our own sake, because whatever we hold on to on our deathbed is going to be an anchor to this material world. You give it all away. All of it. It's also better for the family. How many problems arise when they have to decide after you're dead who gets what? Give it all away. Hospital's going to have a lien on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you give it away, they may not get it. <laughs> right? <laughs> People just run away with the things. <laughs> so, give your own aggregates and all your possessions and then it says bless me to serve the precious ones with time talent and treasure the precious ones the Rinpoche Rinpoche means precious ones but it means those who are precious because they give us the Dharma and those are the ones that we have to uh, make offerings to and serve because they are the ones that can help us and who, and perhaps more importantly if they are truly precious ones they won't be contaminated with what we give because that is also the problem it's like you know uh, some parents and, and I've heard this from parents says I don't want to leave these riches to my children because I'll ruin them right there's a lot of people who will be ruined by generosity. <laughs> so truly one should choose as the object of our offerings, as the recipient of our offerings, someone who will not be harmed by developing attachment, by developing pride. Somebody who will use it to benefit all sentient beings. That's why a lot of people, not so popular now in the West, but a lot of rich people would, uh, in, the, in the East, build stupas, build images of the Buddha. Uh, it's still very, very common to uh, sponsor the publishing of texts, uh, sponsor retreats, sponsoring uh, teachings. This is very, very common. Um, I went and uh, actually Elizabeth was also there uh, the, the opening of um, Enigma uh, excuse me, Kaju Center in Colorado and people had come from China with everything they brought huge statues of the Buddha, they brought everything Right, they brought offerings for all the monks who were there. They, they understand. They still understand. This is what you do, right? 
if you give it to somebody, and some of them were there with their children, and their children were participating, their children weren't going like, whoa, you know, it's giving this, or, you know, <laughs> you know, it's hurting, it's coming out of my pocket. <laughs> No, they were there joining their parents in like, this is what we do. When I went to uh, the, the Sakya retreat uh, last year, there was a young man there that I was amazed. His parents are very old and they couldn't make it to the retreat. And the Sakyas have this thing that where they, they do a... The Sakya is a, one of the lineages of Tibetan Buddhism. And whenever they do teachings, they have a tea offering in the middle of the morning and a tea offering in the middle of the afternoon and for some reason it's very expensive right? it's offering tea and some kind of little cake or cookie to all the participants yes there were 300 people there but how much can you know tea and cookies be anyway the offering each offering was like $1,500 and that thing lasted a month, and that young man must have paid for the offering, I don't know, 20 mornings and 20 afternoons. And I, you know, I approached him, I said, like, are you that wealthy? He said, no, this is my parents' will. They gave me the money that they have, and they told me, you make offerings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They must now, have known that that's what he needed. <laughs> I'm not saying that, you know, you go crazy now and do that. What I'm saying is, is that if you're going to give, right, also be careful that you don't harm others with your gift. That's why it's not out of, you know, we're not saying this because we're saying, well, give it to me. We're saying be careful because you don't want to hurt anyone with your gifts. So better give to someone who will not become attached. And by the way, a lot of monks and nuns have become very attached. You know, in the United States, we have the Buddhist three ring circus. <laughs> right? And uh, you open those Buddhist magazines and it's like... <laughs> Anyhow, um, just choose the object of your generosity should be a precious one right? in the literal sense in the Rinpoche sense so the next stanza is about making offerings to the protectors and here's the difference right to the three jewels and the superiors we actually make a physical mental and very subtle offerings. To the protectors, what we offer is constant mindfulness. The protectors, at least in our lineage, some lineages they offer things to protectors. Our protectors don't really like things. Our protectors like mindfulness because their role, and by the way, uh, there's a small picture here of um, the Jonang protector Samaya Tara. Um, the interest of the protectors is to protect our practice. So we make an offer, an offering of constant mindfulness that they may watch over our practice, uphold the view that we have developed by our study and our contemplation keeping us from harm, dispelling obstacles, and pacifying our enemies. Now, yes, from the highest point of view, we don't have any enemies. But all ordinary beings have enemies. We even have natural enemies, don't we? I mean, if you meet a hungry tiger, that's a natural enemy. Right? Uh, or uh, a bureaucrat, a, bureaucrat, a mosquito. <laughs> we have them. Same thing. So we're not here, here saying, you know, smite mine enemies, pacify, which is different. <laughs> right? We should never uh, pray to have our enemies defeated, rather pacified. 
We should be protected from harm and they should be pacified. Obstacles should be removed. Obstacles to our practice. I actually had a friend in Boston. She was a good Buddhist, but uh, she understood uh, what is it? Uh, dispel all obstacles as a parking prayer. <laughs> when she was looking for a parking, she was going like, dispel the obstacles. <laughs> um, we live in Texas. You don't know how hard it is to park in Boston. Oh. And if you don't find a spot on the street, they will charge you $24 an hour in a parking lot. That is not right like <coughs> Boston is. They have a little cow path road still. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the parking is premium. Right? Premium. Anyhow, so yeah, this spelled all obstacles. <laughs> No, it's not that kind of obstacles. Obstacles to our practice, right? So, bless me to stay under their watchful eye. So, in the West, we're not so used to this idea of having protectors. Uh, these are uh, those aspects of the Buddhas who have chosen by making an aspiration at the point of becoming from bodhisattvas, great bodhisattvas to Buddhas, they have made the aspiration to protect the practice of others. All beings just before enlightenment receive the prophecy from a previous Buddha and make aspirations. Aspirations are the intentions that will forever become the spontaneous activity of that Buddha. So protectors are beings who at the point of enlightenment have made the formal aspiration to protect the practice of others. So in our case, in the, in the Jonang lineage, Samayatara has taken the vow to protect this particular lineage. And we are very grateful to her. She's pulled us through a uh, century of uh, persecution. Uh, a lot of uh, even scholars thought that we were extinct. <laughs> uh, what is it? News of our demise was greatly exaggerated, right? <laughs> and here we are, and it's thanks to her. So. Uh, she uh, plays an important role, and whenever we feel that we are in danger, we actually recite her mantra, right? And uh, it protects our mind from what? From fear, right? And her mantra is Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Soha. 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 It's very beautiful. And we have some beautiful melodies to sing it. Mm-hmm. It's, Chris, she's it's not just, exclusive to your, to your lineage, is she? She's not exclusive. Anybody can appeal to her, yes. But we're kind of fond of her and she's fond of us. Like that she's your the national She's our protector. National protector. Like yes. some countries. Yes. She's our like our patron saint. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's it. Right. <laughs> like, you know, if we were Greek it would be Saint Nicholas. Right. Yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> There's a specific reason. Our great teacher Taranata wrote many, many sadhanas or rituals uh, for her and uh, commended our lineage into her care. So then we come to the last stanza and this stanza I've always found incredible. It's, it's, it's a little twist on the teaching uh, that Joss gives us something very practical to go by. If I encounter happiness, let me be grateful for any happiness. If I encounter suffering, 
Let me redouble effort. All suffering should be a motivation. It shouldn't be like, oh, poor me. It's like, whoa, <laughs> time to move. Get moving, right? Redouble effort. If I encounter suffering, redouble effort. And then it has this line that I find very significant. Bless me to know that gratitude is wisdom and effort is compassion. After all, everything that we have received right, has been given freely to us, even our lives. The Dharma, everything right, we have received. So gratitude is wisdom, and wisdom is gratitude. It's, and and the, the most important thing for which we should be grateful is our own Buddha nature, and to know that we have that Buddha nature. Right? We should always be grateful. You don't have to build your enlightenment. You don't have to construct your natural perfection. Right? Aren't you grateful for that? You know how long it would take you <laughs> to... So little by little, become a Buddha. So, wisdom is gratitude, and effort is compassion. Our own effort, where does it come from? From the guidance of others. And our effort reduces our suffering. That is compassion. Gratitude, right? Whenever we're happy, right? We should be grateful, right? What is love? The desire that others be happy, right? So we have received that love, and the only way to repay love is with love. And that is wisdom, that what I receive, I want for others. Otherwise, we have learned nothing. If we get a gift and we don't know that the person who gave us the gift is actually the, the most important recipient of that gift, right? The giver is the one that is actually more blessed. If we don't get that and we still think, oh, no, no, my getting it is the good part, we haven't learned a thing. So bless me to know that gratitude is wisdom and effort is compassion. And this little uh, stanza here, if I encounter happiness, let me be grateful. If I encounter suffering, let me redouble effort, is a good thing to remember, right? That's what it means, work with whatever you encounter. And believe me, those are the only two things that you will encounter. <laughs> Happiness and suffering. What else are you going to encounter? So one should make you grateful. And that gratitude gives you wisdom. And one should motivate you to redouble your effort. And that is compassion. Remember that compassion is like patience. We have to have compassion with ourselves, with others. We can't, and with our own uh, walking of the path. So our effort is the most direct form of compassion. Think about it. I mean, how do you show compassion for other beings? You have to do something, even if it's mental. So by reciting this prayer, right, we begin, remember what we're trying to do, right? A revolution at the basis. The basis is what? The ground consciousness, which is the repository of all our karmic formations. And we're trying to get a revolution at that base. We're trying to change our tendencies, so that spontaneously we act according to the Dharma. That's why we recite these prayers. 
And now that you've heard the explanation, even if you can't list, I'm not going to give you a quiz like, you know, what are the five uh, negative acts of immediate retribution and what are the four roots of... Uh, no, you've heard it, it's there. Now when you recite the prayer, you don't have to worry about it. It's there. It's already there. And it becomes stronger through repetition. Repetition is our friend. That's how we learned everything. That's how we learned to put on our shoes. Everything we've ever learned, we've learned through repetition. How did you learn to operate a computer? And were you better the fifth time than you were the first time? Mm -hmm. Were you better the hundredth time than you were the fifth time? Yes. Till it becomes what? You don't have to think about it anymore. Right? You Instead of becoming your psychic nature, it becomes your true nature. Yes. Here, fortunately, what we're, we're looking for is to get your true nature to be the default <laughs> instead of the false nature. The default program. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we can do this. You know, it is, it is already there. Whether they are in or out of ourselves, it doesn't really matter right now. The important thing is that they, she, you, <laughs> want your permanent happiness. That is the important thing. That we're no longer separated against ourselves. What was that that Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Right now we are divided against ourselves. And that's why we cannot stand, that's why we keep falling. What we want to do is we want to unite right, with the mind of the Precious One, with the mind of the Buddha, which is our true nature, and stop being divided. Right now we have, you know, we want this and we want that. We want the other thing and we want the, other, the thing that we had yesterday. And we're divided. Our consciousness is divided, our awareness is divided, our desires are divided, everything is decided. Everything is divided. And that's why we suffer. So we need to commit to ourselves. What is it that I truly want? And that's what true mindfulness is. Then we need to remember that that's what we want. And sometimes... We need to tell ourselves, and not only remember, you know, like, yeah, well, I know that I want that, but right now, <laughs> like the famous prayer by, by St. Augustine when he was young, you know, God give me a purity, but not just now. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Very often we're in that, and yeah, I want enlightenment, but right now what I want is a meatball sandwich. Yes. Is, is attachment always accompanied by fear? Yes. The moment you are attached to something, you fear losing it. Or if you don't have it, because we can be attached to things that we don't have, we have the fear of never getting it. It's intrinsic to attachment fear, either of losing it or not getting it. Or getting it and it not being what you, <laughs> what you thought it would be. <laughs> yes. Always. Always fear. Attachment and hope are the other side of fear. Whenever you hope, you fear. So I would say, no hope, no fear. Make a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is attachment inevitable in duality? It is normal, but we can get fairly away from it. However, it's relatively said, clear. clear. Huh? Relatively clear. That's a joke. Yes, it's true. <laughs> it is. 
I mean, as long as we have these bodies, yes, there will be some attachment. In fact, the, the attachment that the scriptures say, even saints are attached to their bodies. Less attached than we are, but there is some attachment. Right? But it can be minimized to the point where it's not harmful. There is, um, my teacher used to speak of functional attachment. Uh, you need some level of attachment. Or you won't get out of bed. Or, or you won't keep your, your body healthy. You need some level of attachment. You, know, you need to feed it, you need to wash it, you need to clothe it, you need to put it to rest. Uh, you need some level of attachment. But he called it a functional attachment. He says, just what is necessary and no more. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Okay, one, two, three. Yes. <laughs> um, I am not familiar with the Dharma. Uh, um, I have a question. So, in the Dharma, the creation of the humanity is uh, very different from, the, you know, the Christian. The yes. All those I would be curious to know what the... There is no creation in the Dharma. There is no creation. No. It is a manifestation of a particular state of consciousness. That's why we speak of realms. So if you have a particular type of consciousness, it will manifest in a particular type of body, in a particular type of realm. Um, and it is, we do not speak of origin because origin presupposes that there's linearity in time. And time is actually a perspective. It's an order of attention. It does not, you know, what is past, what is present, what is future depends on what you pay attention to. What you paid attention to a moment ago becomes past. What you're paying attention to now is present and what you will pay attention to later is the future. But another person can actually have a different perspective. Let me prove it to you. Two people watch a fight. And they're watching the same fight. And when they describe the fight, one will say, no, she started. And the other said, no, 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 I was there. He started it. And I'm not saying, you know, let's, let's assume that these are not biased people. You know, they're not doing it to lie. That's the way they saw it. The one that says that the woman started was looking at the woman first and then looked at the man. <laughs> And the one who says the man started was looking at the man and then looked at the woman. It's the sequence of attention that establishes time, nothing else. You could be looking at the light of a star that died a billion years ago. Yes. And we think, oh, it's now. Well, it's just not now. It's your, your attention now. Right? That's all it is. It's not even there. So we don't it really, I mean, time is something that we use conventionally, but it has no real existence. So suppose it that there was a beginning. It's kind of irrelevant. So uh, we talk of uh, since time immemorial, <laughs> right? Or since beginningless time, to use a phrase, but it's constant. Right? Manifestation is constant. It happens in cycles, but it, there's no point of beginning. Uh, there are severe problems that even Christian theologians have been dealing with, uh, with positing a, you know, a creation act. Uh, very severe logical and theological problems. Uh, with that concept. And the Buddha actually, some people say that Buddhists are atheists. We're not atheists. In fact, we accept all the gods. They're beings just like we are. They're just not a thought creator. Um, but frankly, you know, they're in their own realm. We have to deal with this one. We are here. Right? So, the Buddha said, there are questions that are not 
beneficial for your cultivation and you know speculating and literally I'm not making this up I know people think I exaggerate but there were theologians right in Europe who wrote books and carried on debates for decades about how many angels could dance on the tip of a pin and they will have said you know how does that help you let them dance if they want to dance right it doesn't really matter or if we go for example to india does it really matter whether it's really 33000 gods or 33001 who cares it doesn't matter you still have to deal with action and reaction with cause and effect there's a lot of superstition in many religions, right? And I'm sure there are a lot of, of superstitious Buddhists too. I'm not saying that Buddhists are not superstitious. Buddhism is not superstitious. But there's a lot of superstitious Buddhists. But to think that you can just sit there and continue doing what you've been doing, but if you pray, things will change. Some people do, like, you know, I don't want to do anything about my life, but I'm going to sit here and I'm going to, like, you know, welcome so-and-so into my heart, fill in the blanks. It could be Jesus, it could be Krishna, it could be Shiva, it could be, you know, whoever, Thor. Uh, well, there's some people who do. There's a Jedi church in America. Do you know that? Jedi? Yes, they study the teachings of Master Yoda. <laughs> they take it seriously <laughs> oh yes there's everything yes that's all plagiarized from Buddhism yes try not no <laughs> there's still no church of Darth Vader or I'm sure it's coming I think there is. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty there probably is. So, in Buddhism we say, you know, you have to work out your path of liberation. The Buddhas are there to help you. They're there to guide you. They're there to encourage you. They're there to support you. They're there to transfer their merit to you, but they will not take over your life and do it for you because it's not good for you that is your problem right each one of us we have allowed conditions to turn us into victims how is becoming the victim of someone good going to change that situation the Buddha wanted us to become enlightened for ourselves. To stop this dependence on external circumstances. Now, when we invoke their assistance, right, we are participating with them. It's like the difference, you know, if a child comes home with homework, from school and throws the homework at the parent says you do it the parent would not be a good parent if the parent did the homework but if the child comes <clears throat> and sits down starts working and then calls the parent and says can you help me with this that's an appropriate role for the parent and that is helpful for the child the child will learn so the Buddhas are good parents if you are working, if you are following the path, they will work with you. Right? But if you're not, they're not going to do you the disservice of continuing the problem that you have, which is not taking responsibility for yourself, believing that you're a victim. That is our main problem. We believe that uh, it's her fault, it's his fault, they did this to me. It's not helpful. Not helpful. 
So, they've given us so many tools. They've given us so many ways. This is not the only way. Our lineage, I like it, that's why I'm in this lineage. But there are many others. Right? And the Buddha himself, when he was approached by people of other beliefs and other practices in the India of his time, he never tried to dissuade them from their path. He would ask them, what do your teachers say? And do you practice that? That was, and there's records of that in the sutras. Like people would come to him and say, you know, like, I'm so and so from such and such a school, and I would like to know what is your opinion on this or that. And the Buddha said, What does your teacher say, and do you practice that? Because you cannot come and ask me questions about what we would do if you're not even doing what you already think you know. (laughs) know, I don't follow my own religion, but I'd like to know what the Buddhists think about it. We have to work out our own liberation and enlightenment with their help, with their guidance, with their transfer of merit, But we have to do it. We have to at least move towards them. My teacher used to say, the Buddhas are ladies and gentlemen. They will not force even their grace on you. If you don't want it, they won't give it. And wanting it is not just a question of saying, I want it, I want it. No. Wanting it means that you live in such a way that it shows that you want it. Want, you know, we have a, a weird loss of semantics in English. What does want mean? We think it means like a desire. Want doesn't mean that. Like, like a plant wants water. It's not that the plant sits back and says, I'd like a glass of water. No, it wants water. It needs water to survive, right? So what do we really want? Unless we make that determination, in our lineage we call it the definitive aspiration. Unless we make that definitive aspiration that what we want is the best possible outcome, enlightenment, full enlightenment, and we will not settle for anything else, That doesn't mean that, you know, we, we all take on robes, no. <laughs> to take on the definitive aspiration means that we are not willing to sell ourselves short. If you want enlightenment, are you going to really settle for the new Mercedes? And most people really can't even get the new Mercedes. It's, you know, they'll settle for the new iPad, right? <laughs> or the new, you know, tennis shoes or like... Come on, if you have to compromise your principles for something that you know it's not going to last. Or for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. or That doesn't mean that you live without nothing and you live without anyone. It means that you know what is the proper perspective. And none of these things, none of these people... None of these situations will give you permanent happiness. Enlightenment will. All these other things, if they come, fine. If they don't come, it's equally fine. If they don't come, usually you don't have to deal with the aftermath. (laughs) Really, think about it. You don't have it. My, My grandmother used to tell me all the time, mijo, mijo means my my son, mijo, you are the slave of what you have and the owner of what you don't have. It's true. If you have something, you have to take care of it. If you don't have it, you don't have to take care of it. (laughs) It doesn't own you at all. So, please, my friends, think about this. 
if you feel so inclined, recite these prayers and plant these seeds in your mind so that your own Buddha nature awakens, right? That is the meaning of Buddha, the awake. So we are there. The Buddha nature is there. Right now we are sleeping. Buddha nature is never sleeping, but we are, right? So allow that Buddha to manifest. Allow that awakening to happen. It's all there. So please let us dedicate. By the merit I grew through all our virtual acts, may all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all embrace happiness and the causes of happiness. May all abide in peace free from self-grasping. May all attain the union of wisdom and compassion. Om Ah Mum Soha.